Hi, this is Barry, and welcome to the next episode of Simplicity Zen Podcast. If you enjoy these podcasts and want to help us out, please consider going to YouTube and clicking on the subscribe and alert buttons. And the main reason is that YouTube uses those metrics in deciding how widely to distribute this uh, podcast on their platform. So it would be helpful if you could take a moment and do that. Thanks. Um, today, my guest is the Reverend Mio Leahy. He's a Dharma heir of Tenshin Reb Anderson in the Suzuki Roshi lineage, Soto lineage. He's abbot of the Isenji Urban Temple in San Francisco, and he's also the guiding teacher of Valley Streams in Sacramento. Thank you so much for being here today with us, Reverend. You're welcome. Did I did I pronounce all the names right? Yeah, sure. Close enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so uh, before we get um, a little bit into um, the biographical stuff, could you talk a little bit about what kind of your 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 daily roles are at um, East and G? I've, I've, I've actually it just kind of dawned on me like I'm not really sure what an abbot does at a um, traditional temple. Like what? Could you kind of paint a picture of what a typical day would be like for you? Um, well, apart from um, uh, going to the Zendo, I I think a typical day for me is much like it would be for anybody mm-hmm. else. Uh, I, I live where I work, so I don't commute. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, there, are, you know, on any given day, there are any number of things that need to be attended to. Mm-hmm. Whether it's the ancient building that's falling down, or um, I, I frequently help help out with the animals. Here we have two cats and a dog who need mm-hmm. looking after, and I help with that. And. Um, other than that, really nothing special. Mm-hmm. Occasionally, we'll have uh, visitors, um, but uh, also particularly since the uh, plague uh, in these past couple of years, uh, our um, interface with the community uh, has been greatly reduced. So, mm-hmm. only so just now, in the past say month or two we've started to invite people to come back physically to the temple. Mm-hmm. When uh, you say we, do you have some residents living there with you? Yes, there are five of us all together mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, as I say, this very old building. And um, uh, we're in a uh, busy neighborhood in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. We're, uh, uh, we're a block and a half from 18th and Castro. Mm-hmm. which means this is a, a neighborhood uh, geared to entertainment and mm-hmm. to transient visitors. Mm-hmm. So uh, that means there's a lot of activity, especially during the weekend. Mm-hmm. And it can get pretty pretty noisy. Uh, our, our temple, fortunately, is relatively quiet unless the, the neighbors are kicking up a fuss. Do you so, ever get... Um visitors and morning zazen who've been up all night partying not anymore you used to mm-hmm. but uh maybe those days are gone <laughs> they certainly are for me although they didn't last very long in my case anyway so yeah did um do, so the your residents are they monks or lay people or a mix uh they are all um lay people mm-hmm uh and um oh ex- no i take that back my our our second in command our tanto david bullock is is uh, priest ordained and and, and the other folks are either have received jukai received the precepts or maybe not even that so um, uh, do you uh, do you have like a daily routine of i, I remember someone was telling me that they there's like there's a bunch of stations they have to go through every day and do chanting and do, do you do you have those pepper responsibilities too where you kind of have like solo chanting responsibilities as an abbot no no not here mm-hmm. this is you know this is an american temple mm-hmm. and um 
the many and complex observances that would take place in a Japanese temple, mm -hmm. we don't have. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a small subset of ceremonies we observe a monthly or in some cases yearly. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's much simpler than an Asian temple would be, mm -hmm. uh, where every day could be a little bit different, mm -hmm. and the the poor the poor novices have to memorize all of this stuff about based on minimal cues what they have to set up for that particular day or that particular event. But mm -hmm. fortunately, we don't have any of that. Mm -hmm. So this is much like. Uh, uh, living together uh, under other uh, urban circumstances mm -hmm. uh, you know in many ways it's not so special but um, uh, there's an emphasis on uh, the the three pillars of Soto Zen which um, I think I talked about it uh, Valley Streams um, uh, Shikantaza, or just sitting. Mm -hmm. uh, Genjo Koan, or relating to the given moment as manifesting the fundamental point, as Dogen calls it. And also, Nemitsu no Kaku, or uh, punctilious attention to the details of everyday life. Mm -hmm. So those three factors are, are important for us. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and a kind of a, a footnote is the, the way we arrange living together is based on the principle of leaving no trace, mm -hmm. which is actually fairly challenging for a lot of folks. Yeah. Um, the idea is whether you're using the kitchen or the bathroom or the laundry or whatever, there should be. It should not be obvious that anyone was ever there. Hmm. Uh, in I, terms I really of, like that. I've never in, obviously in, with camping. I'm familiar with it, but I've yeah. I've never seen. I've never conceptualized that. Yes, the, it's great. I love it. Yeah, it, as I say, it presents a challenge to some folks, but we do fairly well. Mm -hmm. uh, so do we you, had a, a visitor drop by a, a while ago. Just a very young man. Oops, my ear thing just fell off. Can you still hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, and, uh, he, he just came in to kind of look around and see what we were up to. And, uh, he said something like, uh, well, it's very clean, which I was surprised by, cause I don't think it's that clean. Uh, but I guess actually we do fairly well. Hmm. And, uh, as I say, you don't leave dishes in the sink. You don't leave crumbs on the counter, none of that. Hmm. And that is a way of. Uh, manifesting the, the careful uh, and attentive mind of Zazen in everyday life. Do you guys have formal temple cleaning every day after Zazen? Uh, to some degree, yes. And then do you, do you guys do a daily service, like Heart Sutra and so forth? Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, just Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Uh, it used to be every day, and then the plague kind of knocked things into a cocked hat, as they say. So right now it's Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Monday, Wednesday, Friday is what we call open sitting. So there is there isn't any ritual set up for that, uh, and we just go and do zazen. And do you um, do you do you meet regular in dokusan with the residents? Like, are you their teacher? Uh, no, not, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, there is one resident, I guess, who I would say is a student of mine. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but, uh, just as, um, well, I don't know, back in the day, Suzuki Roshi did not often do Dokusan mm -hmm. with people. I don't either, unless somebody asks, if mm -hmm. somebody asks, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I don't like expect people to turn up every day for, uh, an interview. That's yeah. uh, not my style. Yeah. Yeah. I've done Dokusan with you. It was always helpful. Ah, you know, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, do people live there? Are, do they have jobs out in the community or are they pretty much there full time? Um, uh, every, uh, the other four residents have, uh, some degree of, uh, job to look after. 
mm -hmm. uh, full full time in I guess only one case, mm -hmm. and the other is some somewhat less than that. We have, for instance, two David, uh, whom I mentioned, our Tonto. He's a professional gardener, and has been for many many years. So he has uh, he has uh, clients who are absolutely devoted to him. So he still maintains uh, a, a reduced set of uh, uh, gardening jobs. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Jonathan, who, who also lives here, he's a, a more like a newer gardener, and he is taking that up also. But neither of them has a, like a full time job. Mm -hmm. And do they find you through the Suzuki Roshi ecosystem or are they all kind of from all walks of the Zen life? The people who are here? Yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, Jonathan and I have known for quite a few years. And when I was uh, Tonto at Tassahara, uh, uh, we, we had a, a teaching connection there. Mm. And um, uh, so at some point when he... He and I both came back to San Francisco, and then um, he uh, was coming over here to see me for for a practice discussion. Mm -hmm. And at some point, it uh, made sense for him to be a resident, so he moved in. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, David it ha is uh, uh, was ordained by Isan, so he's oh. like a, he was like an original member of the temple. And so after a fairly long absence. Uh, while I was um, uh, being practice leader here, he uh, he started uh, sitting here again, which was I thought was great. And again, when there was a residential opening, uh, uh, he thought maybe it would be good for him to live here again. So here he is. Hmm. And then that that leaves Cheryl and Ty, who um, uh, Cheryl, I've also known for quite a while. I don't remember exactly. It wasn't through, I think through here, actually. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, Ty was, uh, lived for some while at uh, City Center, San Francisco Zen Center on Page Street. Mm -hmm. And when there was an opening here, he applied to uh, live here. And that was already a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, a, uh, it's a fairly stable household, which is great in some ways. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then most of the people, you know, pre-plague, most of the people that came in, they're just people that live in the neighborhood. Um, the people, you mean non-residents? Yeah. Non-residents that just come in for daily sitting. Uh, yeah. Walking or, distance, you think? or not necessarily neighbors or anything. Sometimes mm -hmm. they come from a little further away than that. Okay. We'll take Muni or, Muni or whatever. Yeah. Or even drive here. Okay. Yeah. And, particularly, uh, particularly on Saturday, which is still the day when we have the most visitors. Mm -hmm. When when Isanji was um, is it Isan or Is Isanji Isanji mm -hmm. was it conceived as a gay and lesbian center or is it or just because of its geographical lo location it kind of just wound up that way? Well, in, you know, in the early and mid '80s, this neighborhood was uh, much more distinctly gay, mm -hmm. and uh, um, so so the the origination of the temple was when I forget how many, four or five or six, like maybe I think it was four gay men and two lesbians mm -hmm. who, who had practiced to some degree uh, mm -hmm. and decided they wanted to uh, live together and create a practice place where they felt welcome. Mm -hmm. So uh, they kind of ga gathered their resources together and, and bought this building. Mm -hmm. And then they invited Isan over from Page Street, where he was living, mm -hmm. uh, and eventually uh, uh, asked him would he would he live with them, which he agreed to do. Mm -hmm. And that was, of course, right at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. And uh, 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 Isan quickly realized that um, gay men with AIDS were a were a drastically underserved population. Mm -hmm. So he had the idea of establishing uh, a hospice or a place of care for people. And he, so he started doing it and in, invited the other residents and students to join in. And they did. And that mm -hmm. was the beginning of the Maitri Hospice. Mm -hmm. uh, Is that and, an ongoing organization? Hmm? 
Is that an ongoing organization? Yes, but in the, I think, late 90s, it moved from here over to a, a kind of a purpose-built um, uh, setup on uh, Church Street. Uh, so now it's its, a, it's, its own uh, entity. But for a while, they were kind of under the same umbrella. Uh, but gradually, the, the demographics of the uh, neighborhood have shifted. And now the, the um, I don't know what, the, the percentage of LGBT folks who live here has, has uh, uh, decreased quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's still a place for LGBT folks to come and uh, recreate. Mm -hmm. So... There's yeah. plenty of recreation going on, and a lot of LGBTQ businesses are still here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, things change, as Buddha said. Yeah. And sure enough. Yeah. Um, so segueing a little bit to kind of your journey, um, mm -hmm. you've mentioned a couple of times in Dharma Talks that I've attended that you, you grew up fairly religious, Catholic, if I remember correctly. Yeah, uh, but I, I would use the word observant. Okay. That is, my parents were observant, but not particularly religious. Could you, could you describe what the distinction would be? Um, yeah. Religious and observant. Uh, observant means you are outwardly uh, a Roman Catholic, and you, mm -hmm. you do all the stuff that um, Roman Catholics do. Mm -hmm. you, you attend church and... Um, you know, holy days of obligation and receive the sacraments and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But the motivation was not necessarily based on uh, what? Faith? Oh, it was certainly based on faith, but um, it was just something that you did if you were a Roman Catholic. Yeah. Okay. So this is what you do when you're a Roman Catholic, and that's, that's what we did. Mm -hmm. I was a bit different from both my brother and me. My my brother, as you probably know, is a is a, a priest in the Roman Church. I didn't know that actually. Oh yes, oh. Uh, and he's just uh, a little ways down from here in, in Daly City. He has a he has a parish of his own. Mm -hmm. uh, so both he and I were, I don't know what, affected by the uh, the the numinous atmosphere that is still there to be appreciated in the observances of the Roman church. Mm -hmm. And well, cause we were both little kids and that, that tends to affect one on a level that is kind of not so subject to conscious interference. Mm -hmm. And so that remains a kind of a, I don't know what a capacity that affects how one relates to one's life. And um, uh, this, is, this is what led to the, the sort of ferment I found myself in when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I still appreciated uh, the, an, an observant life, which was part of the, um, the boarding school environment that I was introduced to. Mm -hmm. And I, I was a, uh, in a, a boarding school le uh, run by European Benedictine monks for four years. Hmm. Was that, how did you wind up in that situation? It was my parents' idea. Mm -hmm. I would not have selected that for, to, for myself, but that's mm -hmm. what happened. Did your brother attend that same school? Yes, we both did. And um, did, did, do you think those monks kind of created a template of kind of clerical life that kind of lit a fire in you or do you well think it, wouldn't, it or? didn't lit a fire but it was a model mm -hmm. and it was the only model that my brother and i kind of what immediately recognized as i don't know how, how it's done mm -hmm. or what the what the spiritual life looks like mm -hmm. and the difficulty i started to have was though uh i i found it insufficient just to be doing the rote performance mm -hmm. of, of, of these various aspects of the faith that were presented to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I was aware that there was an, there were other traditions in um, Western spirituality and I wanted to know what they were, mm -hmm. but the, um, 
the monastics uh, were not really, I don't know what, they, they did not take my inquiry as seriously as I did. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and you bet, and oh, the sorry. Benedictines are uh, maybe uh, maybe have been for a long time. They're they're one of their special um, apostolates is teaching. So mm -hmm. this was a, a high school, mm -hmm. and that's kind of where where they put their energy. But I wanted to find out about contemplative life, and they weren't really able to tell me. And they kind of I kind of got the brush off, and that made me quite angry. You, you mentioned numinous before. Yes. Um, and so did, so growing up as a kid or a teenager, did you feel a sense of sacredness? Did, did you ever feel like a sense of presence or sacredness or you know, just like an intuitive yeah. sense that there was something out there or you probably conceived as God as a child, I imagine, you know? Well, something, but it, it, the, 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 the sense was that, uh, inside of the world of the Roman church mm -hmm. was a numinous something. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I certainly had no sophistication in terms of figuring out what that was, mm -hmm. but it was there. And um, uh, I associated that numinosity with uh, actual spiritual life. And if it, mm -hmm. if that was not, present, then it was not valid to me. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I tried to find out how one goes about cultivating that on a day to day basis in one's life, mm -hmm. I was not encouraged. Mm -hmm. Have so you read any? About, when I was about 14, mm -hmm. I said, well, to hell with you people, I'll find a new religion. So I went looking for it. But did you read any Thomas Merton or Meister Eckhart or anything like that? Uh, I read some Merton. Mm -hmm. um, and I, in fact, I remember I was carrying one of his books around uh, at at the boarding school. And one of the, the monastics saw, saw me with that book. And he kind of snickered and said, oh, that'll keep you busy. And I did not appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I finally said, well, if there's no one around here to relate to on this basis, I will look elsewhere. And that's when I uh, eventually stumbled across uh, Buddhism. Mm -hmm. What well, you said you first looked for in, in Western traditions. Um, did, was it well, uh, when I, that's what I mean when I when I said mm -hmm. here I was in this monastic setting. And so I mm -hmm. thought that's where I would find it. Mm -hmm. but there was no one there to explain it. I wonder if, if through the luck of a draw, like if you, like if it was Franciscans, or do they have more of a contempt, contemplative, I say the word, um, contemplative, yeah, contemplative. Um, um, not necessarily. No. Yeah, okay. I mean, there, there, there are, there are probably more or less contemplative Franciscans, just as there are more or less contemplative Benedictines. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I wound up with the ones who were more or less. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they were you know, very engaged in establishing mm -hmm. this school. And, uh, um, uh, you know, when, and it was, when I was there, it was very, very small. Mm -hmm. uh, my graduating class in 1969 was, I forget, we were like, I don't know, 17 or 18 of us. That was the whole class. So, uh, um, it, it was an unusual environment and I think it could have been, um, uh, it could have been much more, uh, uh richly utilized for the mm -hmm. sake of the students, mm -hmm. but instead, you know, we just, we had religion classes and textbooks mm -hmm. about this or that, or about the Bible or something and nothing about how do you cultivate a contemplative life? Nothing about that. Interesting. Yeah. You so you talked about a sense of numinous presence. Did you ever think in terms of Jesus? Like, did you have a personal devotion to Jesus at all? Well, uh, that, that's not the same uh, feature in in Roman Catholicism as it is in uh, particularly American Protestantism, where okay. 
you know, it's that's really a thing that they have really leaned on very hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was not part of my upbringing at all. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't think I said numinous presence. I think I just said okay. numino numinosity okay. or numinous. And whether that was a, what was that, a person? I don't know. I, I didn't mm -hmm. I didn't go that far. Okay. Uh, it was just a sense that this um, perspective on human life has at its heart something ungraspable and, kind of very, a and, and very much alive. And I just, that's what I wanted to find out about. So kind and of like too bad, a, too bad I didn't meet Thomas Merton or, yeah. or brother David Steindlerost or, or one of those guys. That mm -hmm. would have been great. Yeah. Brother David's one of those definitely very contemplative Benedictines, mm -hmm. but I didn't meet any of them. Mm -hmm. So there was nobody to ask. So I thought, well, I'll, talk to these guys over here and that eventually uh i wound up going to practice Azen once a week uh i, I borrowed a, a um, fellow student's car and drove to los altos where suzuki roshi had a, a little sitting group and that was my introduction to really wow Azen. that's fascinating yeah. i didn't know yeah. that and had you been doing some reading about buddhism prior yes. to yeah cool. Uh, I started. Well. I started reading uh, in in Theravadan Buddhism, mm -hmm. which I thought was well, Buddha's uh, message, if you like, was was pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. um, but I eventually I I found I didn't resonate quite so much with the uh, emphasis on j just the four noble truths. Mm -hmm. You know that was fine, but I again I thought well, the, after about like two years. I, I got the feeling like, well, I'm just reading about Buddhism, and that that was my whole objection. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't want to just read about. It. There has to be a way to do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I had uh, friends, a, a, a man and woman who are proprietors of a one of the first New Age bookstores mm -hmm. uh, in in Menlo Park there, and I would go there every every weekend and hang out. And eventually, I worked there for a while. What was the name of the bookstore? East West Books. Oh, that, that that's an important place in the Grateful Dead history too. In what? Grateful Dead history. Oh, is Grateful it? Dead Prince, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they oh. hung out there sometimes. Oh, how about that? Yeah. I don't think I I didn't I didn't run into them. Yeah. <laughs> that I that I recall. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, one day, uh, Bill Bill Sharfman, who was the the proprietor, said, "Oh, here's a new book that has come in, and it was uh, Three Pillars of Zen." Mm -hmm. And finally, here was something you could do in fact you had to do this is uh you know you could read about it but the whole point was to do it mm -hmm. and and that was where there was a you know there's an appendix back there about how to sit zazen and that's that's where i started mm -hmm. and then i i learned eventually that uh the the uh the that lesson mary Kay had set up the the haiku zendo in los altos mm -hmm. and uh so i started going there once a week is that where um, um, Zen Mind Beginner's Mind was recorded at those talks? Primarily, yes. I believe yeah. so. so conceivably, you were at some of the talks that ended up. Being uh, I never actually saw Suzuki Roshi there. Oh, I heard him recording I talks, but uh, um, uh, all of the the Wednesdays when I went, he was not there. <laughs> okay. But instead, uh, I met, um, uh, I got to know a little bit uh, uh, Kobun Shino. Mm -hmm. uh, sensei at the time, and mm -hmm. Katagiri Sensei was there, mm -hmm. and also another guy, Yoshimura Sensei, very sweet, very sweet man. Three mm -hmm. pretty re reasonably young um, Japanese uh, uh, clergy who had um, responded to Suzuki Roshi's request uh, that maybe they help him out. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of them was always there. Did but, you meet them first or Suzuki first? Uh, Suzuki I met there. I met them first. Okay. What was there anything about their bearing or mode of being or anything that was compelling to you? Um, Sense of presence. Probably, but it was not so conscious. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, w one thing that the 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 Soto clergy can cultivate, not necessarily deliberately, but there's a certain elegance mm -hmm. about them 
which mm -hmm. bespeaks uh, a certain presence of mind. Mm -hmm. Um, Katagiri Roshi's English was very hard to understand, <laughs> mm -hmm. but he was very, he was a very sweet guy. And, uh, um, so as I said, uh, his, his presence was, was one factor and, uh, Kobenshino's English was much better. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Yoshimura sensei was also another very, very sweet guy who unfortunately died of some strange kidney ailment. Um, so, so that was kind of sad, but anyway, these were all, these were people I actually met and mm -hmm. I didn't meet Suzuki Roshi until 1970. I see. And so what year, what year were you working at the bookstore and going to that? Suzuki? Well, that would be while I was still in high school or just after. So late sixties mm -hmm. and early seventies, maybe. Did you go, did you go to university? Yes. Huh. Yeah. I went to, uh, uh, first I went to University of Santa Clara, uh, down San Jose way there, and uh, then, uh, transferred to Berkeley in 1971. So I could study Sanskrit, which is what I thought I really had to do. And, uh, what was the major? Was it religious studies or? I started off with religious studies, but then I, I changed to Sanskrit. As my That's the name of the major Sanskrit. Um, uh, no, it was, what did they call it? south and southeast asian studies that was oh. the heading fascinating yeah and um yeah so so back it up a little bit so you discovered three pillars of zen did you start sitting on your own yes or did you okay i did yeah and was there anything compelling about that experience like was it were you ambivalent about it first or were you immediately like okay this is what i was looking for i know i was i jumped right into it mm -hmm. <laughs> something i really wanted to do for good or ill, you know, not like I was at all clear about what I was taking on. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you've mentioned a couple times, you know, in the intervening years that you're not a huge fan of Three Pillars of Zen, but at the time, was it very compelling to you? Did it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. At the time, I, uh, uh, the, um, the, the subtlety and profundity of Sota Zen was uh, uh, that was a long ways away from me at that point. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 instead I went for the, um, you know, the much more engaging uh, uh, public relations mm -hmm. <laughs> aspect of uh, mm -hmm. three pillars and, and this notion that one should cultivate a big experience. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, okay, if that's what you have to do, that's what I'll do. And it was a while before I discovered that there were other pillars, mm -hmm. that that was not the only approach mm -hmm. or even necessarily the best. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so being gay, did that have a, so were you out in high school or were you no. in the closet? No, okay. no not until, and, uh, until I was 24. Mm -hmm. What, what? Did that kind of having not been able to be yourself? Do you think that was a a variable at all in in getting into Zen or? Well, um, did you think about it in those terms? I don't think not. Not in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, I I was uh, I was a very neurotic teenager, may, maybe more so than you know average. I mean, mm -hmm. most teenagers are neurotic, but I was quite neurotic, mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, my, my parents found a, a psychiatrist for me, very, really sweet, sweet guy, very nice doctor who was lived in our community, which I always thought was a little awkward, but anyway, uh, not for, not for me, but to, to, um, be the, the psychiatrist who's treating the children of a lot of your friends. It seems like that's kind of, anyway, it se seemed to work out for people. So, uh, but he, um, he was, you know, kind of classically trained psychiatrist. You know, he had his training in the, I don't know, 50s, 1940s and 50s. Mm -hmm. And so there was no understanding there at all of the uh, human sexuality as a healthy spectrum. Mm -hmm. You know, you're either here or you weren't. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't here, then you were, you know, ill. Mm -hmm. So... 
so I tentatively, you know, talked to him on more than one occasion about being attracted to men. And he was always kind of gently discouraging mm -hmm. and uh, going back to the kind of crude psychoanalytic psychoanalytic model, mm -hmm. which is that if you're if you're gay, it's because there's a kind of um, I don't know, I don't remember what a weird Oedipal role reversal or something in your psyche, mm -hmm. something like that. And he, he said, I didn't have any of those traits. So I was obviously not gay. So I thought, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> and <laughs> and that, that lasted until I was in my 20s and, and mm -hmm. suddenly thought, wait a minute, something's wrong here. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I had a girlfriend in, in college at the university and lived with her for a while. And, and that was okay, but something was not right. Something off. Yeah. <laughs> and it took a while to discover what that was. But I don't think that was really a factor back then. At least okay. That's what I would say today. Yeah. Um, so when you were in college, were you, uh, were you, were you living in Berkeley and were you going over to San Francisco Zen Center to practice? Uh, mostly I was sitting at the Berkeley Zen Center in those okay. days. Was Mel the, yeah. Was he a teacher at that point or was he just kind of like main well, head student type of thing? Kind of. I mean, um, you know, Suzuki actually asked him to set up a, uh, you know, a sitting group in, in Berkeley in the East mm -hmm. Bay and uh, there wasn't anybody else around. So he was kind of the teacher. When you, um, can you talk about when you first met Suzuki Roshi or encountered him? I mean, what were your yeah. impressions of him? Well, I, uh, you know, again, this is another story I've told a lot. So I, I, you know, I don't want to beat it to death, but, um, so I, I, I started to uh, trying to develop as I was in practice in, in 1969 and, in maybe late 70, mm -hmm. uh, I think this is right, maybe late 70, uh, I, I simply called up the Zen Center and I said, uh, I'd been sitting for a couple of years, which I stretched it a little bit. <laughs> it's more like a year and a half or you know, year and three quarters or something. But anyway, I said a couple of years and uh could could i uh talk to suzuki roshi mm -hmm. and in those days you could mm -hmm. so the person said uh yeah okay why don't you come at such and such a time and such and such a day and mm -hmm. there was there's no real fuss about it mm -hmm. uh so i i showed up and this very nice woman pat pat harishoff was the jisha and she showed me upstairs there and at Page Street. This is at, they were at Page Street by this time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, so we were at, at the door of, uh, it wasn't the actual, uh, what's now the Dokusan room was not where he was. I think it was next door in, mm -hmm. in what became the tea room. Mm -hmm. But uh, so Pat rang this little bell and, and and finally the door opened and there was this tiny little guy, you know, came mm -hmm. up to like here. <laughs> so I was a little surprised by that, but he mm -hmm. in invited me in and, and, uh, you know, had, had me sit down. He put out what was a, what I didn't recognize at the time was a little Seiza bench. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was, I think he was sitting Seiza if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Uh, but and I pr pr proceeded to sit on the Seiza bench and tried to cross my legs, which, and he had a very puzzled look on his face. And so finally he got up and said, Oh, no, no, no. And, and took that away and gave me a Zafu instead. And, uh, so I just, I just told him that, uh, I, you know, how do I know if I was doing it Zazen correctly? And, mm -hmm. and I, I said, can you, you know, test me to see? And he, he, he gave me a very funny smile and huh? what? I don't know. Uh, so then he, he said, you know, have I had the instruction? And I said, yes, thinking of the book, mm -hmm. but it turned out he meant at, you know, from one of the folks at uh, Page Street. Mm -hmm. 
So I said, oh, no, no. And so he said, well, it'd be good to, to do that. And then he wanted to hear all about my university life. <laughs> and at that time, uh, I was still at the University of Santa Clara. So I was still, I was a French major. Mm -hmm. And he thought that was fascinating. He thought that was really great. And so we just chatted back and forth. And then after a while, he said, okay, let's just sit. Hmm. And so we just sat there and, you know, I kept, you know, peeking at him to see what he was up to. <laughs> and he wasn't doing anything. And, uh, uh, you know, it felt like a really long time. Mm -hmm. It was probably like five minutes. Mm -hmm. Were you, did you have any like, oh my God, this is an enlightened Zen master here in front of me? Or, or no, kind of that not, so. not at that time. I did not. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I just sat there with, because he was just sitting there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was that was my real introduction to Zazen. Let's put it that way. Okay. Uh, and finally, after you know a month <laughs> or whatever it was, he said, "Okay." And uh, so we bowed. Oh, but first, uh, when I went in to see him, I, I did the what I thought was the traditional prostration. Mm -hmm. And and then, but he got up right away and said, "Oh no, your bow is not perfect." So then, he came over and stood next to me and showed mm -hmm. me how how to do a, a mm -hmm. prostration. Mm -hmm. So that was a that was an important teaching for me at the time, although I didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. And um, so then I asked him, you know, oh, I said, you know, thank you very much. Uh, can I can I come back again and talk to you? And he said, sure. Mm -hmm. And that didn't happen mm -hmm. because not long thereafter he got sick and then yeah. couldn't see people. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And then his his disciple Richard Baker came back from Japan because uh, Roshi was so sick, mm -hmm. and uh, and I decided I would work with him. He was this you know, big charismatic guy and. Um, spoke perfect English, obviously. And I, that was a real treat, you know, <laughs> having to filter my communication through uh, partial knowledge of English. Mm -hmm. uh, so he became my teacher for like 13 years. Mm -hmm. Did, um, so when he came back, you were, you were in Berkeley at that point? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. And did, did you start working with him and attending those sittings and stuff? Um, while mostly, mostly, you know, um, uh, I would maybe I occasionally, like I'd go to Zazen there or something, but I didn't do any retreats in those mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did, so um, so oh, I would mostly go and see him. That would be why I would go there. I see. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what, what was your impression of him at the time? Well, I thought he was a pretty cool guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, his his uh, grasp of the the teaching of the of the buddha way seemed to be quite genuine and i, I still think it is mm -hmm. never, never mind all of the subsequent goings on mm -hmm. but uh i think i think he understood the teaching and uh, unfortunately there was that whole business of uh suzuki Roshi arranging for him to practice at aheji Mm -hmm. And and he decided, you know, he'd been at Aheji, I don't know, a couple of weeks, and then he called Suzuki Roshi up from Japan and said, "Well, nope, can't do this." <laughs> Suzuki Roshi, uh, you know, I really had to pull a lot of strings to get you in there. They don't take to Westerners particularly. This was mm -hmm. in those days, you know. Mm -hmm. And Baker Roshi was like, "Well, you know." No, can't can't do it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, Suzuki Roshi, you know, said, "Well, well, what are you going to do?" And uh, Baker said, "Well, you know, I have friends in Kyoto, and um, they live right in they live next door to Daitokuji, this huge Rinzai complex there in Kyoto, and uh, one and one of the temples said he could come and sit with them. So." Okay. 
he started sitting Rinzai style and, hmm. and brought aspects of that back from Japan with him. And I do not think that was helpful. Uh, when you say aspects of that, do you mean like a, an intensity or a bearing or like, what would it be like a practical example of that? Um, a, a tendency to uh, focus on the big experience. Oh, really? I didn't realize yeah. that was an aspect of his teachings. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and he um, uh, he un undertook to to do a certain amount of um, uh, uh, huato or hato koan practice with certain people. Really? Nice. Yeah. Which, well, I guess you know he could do what he wanted. Mm -hmm. He was Suzuki Roshi's Dharma heir, and mm -hmm. for for people who had gotten involved with Zen Center and Suzuki Roshi in those days, he was the only game in town. So it was either that or nothing. Yeah. So people went with that and, and I, I went with that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, did some cursory koan stuff with him for, for a while. I didn't realize that. Yeah. So. And, uh, it was it was years before I discovered the numinous heart of Soto Zen practice. Mm -hmm. So that was what, once I did, I was not interested in that other approach anymore. So you're so once you graduated from Berkeley, um, you, did you work for a while, or did you go pretty much straight to? Um, I went to graduate practice? school. Yeah, I'm sorry, say it again. I went to graduate school. Okay. Right away. In Sanskrit? Yes. In Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. um, so I imagine you're pretty fluent then, or were? Well, I don't know if that's the word to use, but but I got my master's degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, started somewhat tentatively working in on the PhD program. What what does um, Tatium P mean? <laughs> what is what? <laughs> Tantium P, Tatium P. As part of the refuges, I'm not sure I quite catch what you're saying. I'm probably, uh, you know, Tatimpi, Buddha. Whoa, 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 whoa! That's uh, that's uh, that's not Sanskrit, but Pali. Oh, okay. I didn't realize. I was. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, it is the Pali refuges. Yeah. So, so the you know you get the first run through, and then the second run through, you say Dutiam. Yeah. Which is a second time. Uh -huh. Oh. Okay. And Tatimpi is a third time. Oh, okay. I, I I never knew what the dot the the um dot MP and top MP meant. Yeah, yeah. So second okay. time, third time. Interesting. Yeah. And it's uh, that's close to the Sanskrit. Sanskrit is uh dvitiam api mm -hmm. or tritiam api. So it's close. Have you read any of the sutras in, in actually Sanskrit? Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Do you do you feel like you get an insight into them that you might be missed with a translation? Well, yeah, just, I mean, to some extent, uh, it's, it's, it can be interesting and worthwhile to, um, uh, study one of the source languages, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, it's not the be all and end all. Yeah. Cause it really blows my mind how much a translation decision can shape understandings. Like for example, yeah. you know, the three poisons. I, I can't even remember the Sanskrit or, or um, Pali term, but yeah. what's, what's often translated as um, hate, which I always thought was like hate, or, you know, mm -hmm. but when I really dove into it, I realized it was really aversion, like just a, aversion in general, not just intense hatred, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and like that kind of like really changed my understanding of that kind of in a pretty profound way, uh. but, it, but it was all due to just to translation decisions. Yeah. You know? uh -huh. Yeah, but um, yeah. So, uh, so did you finish your graduate degree? Uh, the master's, but I I abandoned the PhD, mm -hmm. and and by I don't know 1980 or so, I had had enough of Sanskrit. <laughs> it wasn't gonna. It's was like it was like 10 years, and I was like, yeah. enough already. I I don't actually want to make this my life. So, 
were, were you thinking of maybe becoming a professor or like going to academia? Well, I would have probably had to do something like that. Mm -hmm. And it didn't really have much appeal. Mm -hmm. By that time, after 10 years in academia, mm -hmm. I, I, I had seen its, its, uh, its uh, seamy underbelly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, you know, the politics of academia can be just as awful as any other kind of politics. Worse than Zen Center? Huh? We're as bad as Zen Center? Uh, oh, yeah. Or <laughs> worse, you know. So I thought, okay, no, I don't want to spend the rest of my life in academia. Mm -hmm. And by that time, I was uh, shifting very definitely more in the direction of doing mental health work. Hmm something that I felt more drawn to. Mm -hmm. And um, that almost coincided with the beginning of the AIDS plague. Mm -hmm. uh, that blew everything up in, in my face. Mm -hmm. And so in, um, I guess that would be 80, in 81, uh, it's like I caught the first whispers of mm -hmm. something really terrible happening mm -hmm. and um and somehow and that like drastically shifted my whole perspective and i realized i'm you know i i may have been telling myself for years well you know i'll eventually be ordained and 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 live as a monk and so forth mm -hmm. and i s suddenly it was brought home to me that, you know what? You may not have time. Mm -hmm. So so if you're going to do it, do it now. And so were I you, did. Were you involved in like a party scene at all? Or were you kind of like bookish? Not, not really. I mean, yeah. I, I was definitely pursuing uh, boys mm -hmm. and, and uh, interested in, in uh, you know, establishing a, a substantial relationship as an aspect of my practice. Mm -hmm. But it, that did, never actually worked out very well. Mm -hmm. And in those you days, in, all, in those days, of, like you weren't like in like the nightclub scene. Or, no, 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 I yeah. was not. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I dipped my toe in there mm -hmm. enough to realize I, I this did not appeal to me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but so anyway, in... I guess it was probably late 81. Uh, I went to Zen Center and said, I, I uh, could, could I please move in here? <laughs> and I, cause I wanted to drop everything else mm -hmm. and just, just practice the Buddha way. Mm -hmm. And as it, at the time, uh, the director at the Page Street temple was Isan. Oh, okay. And I already knew him. Because mm -hmm. uh, I had been going to Tassar in the summer, in, like in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I met Isan there any number of times. Like his work, like a work practice student. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was a guest student. Mm -hmm. And that uh, was, uh, he was a great guy, you know, especially for another gay man to find a kind of a role model. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, he was the director. And, and so he helped me uh, arrange things so that I could move in pretty fast. So, that was the late 81 and then February of 82, I moved in there. Had you taken Jukai by this point? Oh, not yet. How about, had you, did you have any extensive session experience or? Uh, no, uh, just, just shorter sittings. Mm -hmm. So like, like one, you know, one or two advises. days or something like yeah. that. And my first seven day was in the fall of, uh, or summer of um, 82. Mm -hmm. And then that fall, Baker Roshi allowed me to go to Tassahara which was very fast actually, and maybe in some ways too fast, but mm -hmm. I was, I was, you know, that's what I definitely wanted to do. So off I went. And, and you saw Baker Roshi as your teacher. Yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and you, you were a dedicated student. Yeah. And um, did he, so, so we moved it. So you got to Tassar prior to Jukai then? Yes. Uh -huh. right. well, what was that like for you? Well, uh, you mean what was? Uh... I'm just going to Jukai is kind of like a oh. like, well, like see, without uh, a strong base of you know practice. Yeah. So I was at uh, Tassahara for a year or so, and then the following spring, you know, in '83, that's when the the blow up happened. Oh, okay. 
And that's when Baker Roshi basically was beheaded and, you know, and off, off he went to do whatever else he was going to do instead of being at Zen Center. And by that time, Reb had Dharma transmission. Okay. So it, the was lineage. Reb around, was a Reb around? Or, oh, yeah. Did you see him around? Oh, yes. With the, what was your early impressions of him? Uh, I, I thought uh, he was the. He was the most badass meditator I'd ever met. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would often go to him for a practice discussion. Hmm. So you, oh, so you, so you had a relationship with him? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Prior to everything blowing up. Yes. Um, and uh, so when things blew up, uh, Jukai's and ordinations stopped mm -hmm. for like a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So it was a while before I had Jukai and then Let's see, when was this? It was 82, 83, 84. Yeah, maybe it was 84. I can't remember so well now. And then 86, I was priest ordained. Mm -hmm. And this was, by this time, Reb was pretty much had his hand on the tiller. And, mm -hmm. well, um, as kind of a entry level student, what was your impression? Like, did you, were there any rumblings of problems or was it just like, Things are fine. Things are fine. Things are fine. Oh my God, the world's ending. Like, was there any? Was there? Like, well, was, to take you guys by surprise, was it, there it did gossip be. or you know? I I was surprised mm -hmm. because I I had, I wasn't part of any inner circle, mm -hmm. so I didn't hear about any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in the um you know in whatever it was, April or May or something, mm -hmm. March of of eighty three. Uh, Mel came down to Tassajara and mm -hmm. uh, I was one, you know, the, the senior students had the other students parceled out among them so they could talk to them about what was going on. Mm -hmm. And so Mel was t told me about, uh, I mean, he asked me right off the bat, he said, so do you know anything about all this stuff involved in Baker Oshie? And I'm like, no, <laughs> duh, I didn't know any of it, you know? Uh -huh. Uh, I, I remembered that um, uh, in the in during the winter practice period, so January of uh, eighty three, mm -hmm. uh, when when uh, Baker was at Tassajara, uh, part of that time there was a, a very attractive blonde lady who was wandering around with him. You know, mm -hmm. and I didn't think anything of it. So his shoes were outside her door. Huh. His shoes were outside her door. More like the other way around. Her oh, shoes okay. were outside his door. Okay. <laughs> but I, I didn't pay any attention to that. I, I just you know, didn't, didn't, didn't uh, make any impression on me. Mm -hmm. So I heard all ab about all that stuff kind of at the last minute. Even like the BMW stuff, there was not like eye rolling. Like, why does he have a BMW? Or, or no, none of that really sank in for some reason. Again, yeah. probably because I wasn't one of the inner circle, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, did you so when things blew up and he left was it disillusioning to you or yeah, did, yeah. Uh, I did not want him to leave mm -hmm. I I told him that that I wanted him to ordain me anyway mm -hmm. which uh, he reacted to quite strongly <laughs> positively or right. negatively yeah or? He, he he gave this tremendous sigh and said thank you very much mm -hmm. so I think by that time he'd been getting a lot of kickback from a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, so but then when he elected to leave zen center mm -hmm. i thought uh no no i'm i'm not in a place where i want to go off and start something new mm -hmm. you know, this is this is uh, you know so oh he invited you to come with him or at least indicated it might be a possibility. well not exactly but i i certainly could have i would have been welcome mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I could have gone to Santa Fe or something mm -hmm. like that, but mm -hmm. uh, I just, I didn't, didn't want to. And by that time I already, I had this connection with Reb too. I didn't mm -hmm. want to let that go. Mm -hmm. So I just decided to stay and he left and that was that. Well, um, I think Jim Hare lived at city center at the time too. Did you know him at the time? Uh, uh, uh Jim and Karen were at Tassajara when I was there in 82, oh, okay. maybe 83 also. Uh -huh. That's where I, I knew him from. And, and Jim and Karen were already married at that point or did mm -hmm. they meet? I, yes, I, I believe so. Yeah. I remember right. Yeah. 
Yeah, so she lived there too at Simpine yes. Gym. Okay, great. Yeah. And then um, Jim used to, uh, he, you know, he wore his. Um, he wasn't he wasn't priest ordained, so he had a sitting robe, mm -hmm. and he would wear his sitting robe over a t-shirt mm -hmm. in, in the zendo in January, which mm -hmm. I, I was very impressed by because I was freezing all the time. There was no heat in the zendo really yeah. to speak of. And mm -hmm. in those days, for some reason, the winters were colder. Mm -hmm. Did Mel Weissman at that point have Dharma transmission through Suzuki's son? Do you know? I don't remember exactly when that happened, but somewhere around there. Did you see him as a teacher or because because you sat with him in Berkeley? I mean, yeah. Did you have like a student relationship to him at all? Or well, up to a point, so, yeah. up to a point, I did. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, by that time, the connection with Reb started to dominate for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. How our, about Isan? Maker, Isan huh? had passed away at that point. No, Isan uh, died in. What is it, 90 or 91? I oh, was it that late? I okay. forget. Maybe 90. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was here. Saw? He was at Isanji. He was at okay. Hartford Street. Mm -hmm. So I would I would come over and visit from time to time and see him. Yeah. Was he the only kind of like prominent gay member of the song at that point? Uh, as far as I knew, there were other other gay members of the song, especially here. Mm -hmm. But he was the most prominent at, at the time. Mm -hmm. Was that heartening to you to see a well-respected? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Oh yes, very much so. Did you do you ever feel like you've experienced any homophobia, like either accident, even accidental, you know, where people don't mean well, but you know, you know well, or, or was that just not an issue in liberal San Francisco? Um, <clears throat> the atmosphere at uh, San Francisco Zen Center mm -hmm. was profoundly heterosexual. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. That didn't necessarily translate into homophobia exactly, mm -hmm. but um, there was no there was no special acknowledgement mm -hmm. or creation of uh, a special welcome or anything for LGBT folks. Mm -hmm. That was here at Harvard mm -hmm. Street. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted that, you would come here. Mm -hmm. But was was Baker Oshie was not at all homophobic, as far as I could tell. Mm -hmm. I guess Mel said something that got people upset. If I, I remember uh, about that. Uh, Mel was um, uh, not woke <laughs> in that respect. Yeah. In those days. Mm -hmm. So you know, he, I, I, I had uh, gone to see him. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe in the late seventies, I would periodically I'd go and talk to him at uh, Berkeley Zen Center. Mm -hmm. and 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 stuff to do with with relationships and whatnot mm -hmm. and he was he was not real comfortable with it that was my sense mm -hmm. he wasn't like off-putting or mm -hmm. dismissive but he wasn't at ease let's put it that way mm -hmm. yeah i mean he's he's even an older generation or was an older generation than baker roshi even right uh somewhat yeah i mean and it could i wonder to some degree it's just he's from an older more conservative generation, you know. Yeah, that's quite possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, any thought of going to live with Isan or asking him to be your teacher or anything like that? No, for whatever reason, you know, he he was more like a friend, mm -hmm. and I think I think that was fine with him. He was happy to relate to people that way. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of like teacher. That that was Reb, and you know, there wasn't any question about that in my mind. He's on. I've I've yet to read his biography criminally enough, but my understanding is he's super charismatic, super welcoming, really just a loving individual. Is that do I have the right gist of him? Uh, he he was you know at at ease with all kinds of people, mm -hmm. and uh, I was not. So I I admired that. Um. Uh, yeah, and he was very welcoming. He was not at all judgmental. Uh, so people immediately felt at ease with him and at home. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's a kind of charism, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay, so Baker Roshi left. Um, you didn't get ordained with him. Did you pretty quickly officially become Reb student in Dujukai yeah. and so forth? Mm -hmm. yeah. And at this point, you were all in. You were 
you wanted to get ordained and yes and have zen as your life right mm -hmm. right and that, and that lasted until 91 i guess mm -hmm. when uh, I had returned to school to do another master's in, in counseling psychology mm -hmm. and met another man there. And I had an eight year relationship with him. Did you move out of San Francisco? I did. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. For like three years, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then when he kicked me out, <laughs> uh, I moved back to Zen Center. During those three years, did you maintain your relationship with Reb? And yeah. And mm -hmm. you were still practicing, you'd still go to the city. And, so and when I could, I would, uh, I would go up to Green Gulch. I still had a truck in those days. So I would go to Green Gulch and go to the seminar for his senior students that he was holding mm -hmm. or uh, uh, attend a class or something like that. Yeah, I made an effort to stay in touch. And were you ordained at this point? Uh, uh, Jukai, but not priest ordained. Okay. Oh, wait, so yes, you... I was. Sorry. I was priest ordained. Uh, sorry, in 86. So uh -huh. yes, I was priest ordained. Uh huh. What, did you did he seem disappointed you were ordained and left because I, I remember uh, when i was interviewing kokyo i guess kokyo left for a relationship at one point and got the sense that you know he asked um he asked um you know um reb anderson like are you mad he's like no maybe just a little embarrassed you know <laughs> <laughs> did you get any of that sense from him well when i moved from green gulch to the east bay to to live with my partner mm -hmm. um uh, I, I just remember one, one day I was at Reb's house and Rusa was there. Um, uh, and, um, uh, somehow that this topic came up, you know, like, uh, uh, I, and may, I think maybe Rusa said something about, you know, well, sorry to see you, you know, moving away. Mm -hmm. And then, and Reb said something like, oh, it's really a non-event and Rusa gave me this look like you know rolled her <laughs> her eyes to him and it's like what are you what are you gonna do with this guy you know <laughs> so um maybe reb knew you would be back or something he, yeah maybe yeah. maybe yeah. um uh, so, so well, just just so you know it's a quarter after and mm -hmm. i have something else i have to do at at uh 2 30 so okay uh is there a, another phase that we yeah sure so we, into or what yeah let's maybe talk a little about your teacher experience so at um so at some point reb must have broached dharma transmission to you yes what, did you see that coming or was that a surprise or that was a surprise mm -hmm. and i was still living in the east bay mm -hmm. and uh on one of one of my visits to green gulch mm -hmm. in, so that would have been what 90 probably like 93 maybe were you said, one of his first dharma transmitted priests i'm trying to think of the list um well i was in the first group of priests that he ordained who were all his students i see and there were six six of us and i was one of those mm -hmm. And uh, so in like 93 or something, when, when I was visiting, he said, uh, I, I'd like you to sew a brown robe. And that was a surprise. I wasn't particularly expecting that. But. And is that something you kind of did secretly or was that kind of- Secretly? You, I mean, like, would you go to the sewing groups and sew with everyone else? And sure. Was like, oh my God, he's sewing a brown robe or, you know. Uh, yeah, no, it wasn't, wasn't secret at all. Yeah. Uh, and he basically told pretty much all of that of his first ordination group we, us six people um i think there was one member of that group who was not really in touch in those days mm -hmm. so i think she I, at that time at least i don't think he asked her to to sew a brown robe and, and the reason i'm asking this question is because i remember in the um i don't remember if it was in david chadwick's book or um she was outside the door but Apparently, like the first indication anyone had of Baker's or of Reb's transmission is one day he started wearing a yellow robe, you know, an ochre robe. And so I was just kind of wondering, like, maybe it's kind of kept hush hush or something, or mm. if that was just unique. Okay. 
No, uh, boy, I, I don't remember it like that at all. I mean, I was at Tassajara at the time. Um, but um, it was just it was it was just known that that uh, Baker would be doing the transmission ceremony with Reb. It was just that's what was happening. I see. And so Reb came down to Tassajara and, and they, they did that ceremony there. And that was 83. So there wasn't so, anything there wasn't anything secretive about it. Okay, that was just the way it was presented in the book. Oh. And it could have been whoever he was interviewing was that was that person's appearance and not necessarily. You know. Which book are we talking about? It was it was either David Chadwick's Crooked Cucumber or it was oh. Shoes Outside the Door. Oh, oh, Shoes Outside the Door. Uh, yeah, uh, watch out for that book. That has got some serious problems from my point of view, having lived there, having mm -hmm. lived through that. Uh, that was not good uh, reporting. Yeah, I mean, my major problem with that book is I, I felt like it was kind of a hit piece against Reb a little bit, you know. Uh, like, yeah, more than a little bit. Yeah. And Reb just refused to talk to the author. And so he had his revenge, I guess. Yeah, that was the, I mean, that's the sense you get reading the book. Yeah. 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 Um, so after you got transmission, did you, um, were you, you were living in the East Bay at that point? Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, no. Um, so I, 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 uh, of the six of us, mm -hmm. uh, I was the first person that he did the ceremony with. I see. And uh, so that was in 99. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was living in the city at that time. It's at uh, um, uh, 340 Page, so mm -hmm. next door to the temple. And mm -hmm. I was the chief financial officer, so I was working in the office a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at 90, in 99, I resigned that office and went down to Tassajara to do the transmission ceremony. And shortly thereafter was asked if I would be Tonto at Tassajara. Mm -hmm. In that, in Tonto, if I really understand the role in that um, system, you, you, you just, it's more, um, you, you, you're the boss of how the temples run ceremonially and religiously. And is, is that kind of the, the main role of it? Or like how, how do you characterize Tonto at Tassajara? What, um, what are your responsibilities? The, the the Tonto is sort of the assistant to the abbot, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But that means that the, the abbot, or in, in Zen Center's case, the abbots, plural, mm -hmm. they're really in charge. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I often found it a little frustrating, to be honest, uh, because some, it's like someone else was always like pulling the major strings. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of like, uh, I was like the, the master of ceremonies or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would have to adapt to whatever the um, practice period leader, whoever that was that turned up that time, mm -hmm. I have to adapt to that, mm -hmm. uh, whatever it was they wanted to do. And when it was Reb, it was great because I uh, felt I understood his mind and mm -hmm. uh, felt that working with him was always very, very dynamic. There's no struggle there at all. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that feeling with all of the other visitor visiting dignitaries. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you, um, so, so you were Tonto, did, did, was your next kind of priest career step was it becoming abbot of DSNG? Well, um, I, I uh, stepped down as Tonto at Tassajara, which I, I probably shouldn't have done. Mm -hmm. But at the time, that's, it seemed like what I should do. Mm -hmm. So then I came back to, the, to uh, Page Street, and I was living there. Mm -hmm. And the... Um, the people who were then on the board of Hartford Street Zen Center mm -hmm. asked me to come over and practice with them. Mm -hmm. And that was the start. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what month that was, probably like August or something. Mm -hmm. And then I think in October or maybe late September, um, uh, it was thought that I could live here. And so I moved over here. 
Mm -hmm. That's now almost 20 years. And that, it, it was explicitly to be Abbott, correct? Well, that not word was not used. Okay. So there was no like mountain seat ceremony. Or no, anything. no, that was years later. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I was just, I was the practice leader, you know, I see. whatever that means. And how, how did your relationship with Valley Streams, the Sacramento sitting group develop? Um, that goes all the way back to um, 2001, maybe. When I was, I was uh, Tonto at Tassajara mm -hmm. and um, maybe I'd already visited, oh, although in those days it was called Iron Bell, mm -hmm. not Valley Streams. Mm -hmm. I had already visited Iron Bell, I don't know, maybe a few times. Just as a visiting teacher. Visiting teacher. Mm -hmm. And then when I was at uh, Tonto, they, they continued to ask me, would I come up to maybe once a month or so, come up to Sacramento? And so I did. So that's more than 20 years now. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, and so that was pretty early in the group's existence, I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so you, you, you said you shouldn't have left your Tonto position. Was it was was leaving because you got frustrated with the rotating cast of Abbott's coming in? And yes, it, somewhat. Yeah. And, and why do you think you shouldn't have left? Um, partly because uh, without realizing it, I surrendered the possibility of retirement at Zen Center. I see. And that, that was a whole, it was a poisoned well to drink from, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, because I thought I had, you know, established that I could return to Zen Center if I mm -hmm. wanted to retire there. Mm -hmm. And I asked I even asked the uh, the the CFO at the time, could you please check and see? And he got back to me and said, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And next thing I knew, no, you can't. <laughs> so, uh, that was a um, serious problem for me. Yeah. Um... So I could have stayed there. And um, my teacher, bless his heart, you know, he'd been at at Zen Center since he was like 19. Mm -hmm. And he didn't he had very little experience of or understanding of what leading a group without those kinds of supports mm -hmm. would mean. Mm -hmm. So he was not able to tell me, oh, wait a minute, you better watch out. And if you do leave, you, you may mm -hmm. find that you're, you're sacrificing a lot. Who makes those decisions? The board? Uh, what decisions? Who can, who can retire and who can't, who can stay and all that. Oh, kind of oh well, while my back was turned, you know, they came up with a policy. So now at Zen Center, everything is like policy. So the policy was you have to have 20 years of employment. I see. And, uh, Anyway, mm -hmm. somebody asked me, I won't name any names, but somebody asked me, oh, you, you should calculate how many years of employment you have. And my, uh, my friend in San Francisco here who had been a labor organizer mm -hmm. said, don't do it. He's the one who told me back when the CFO told me, yeah, yeah, your, your mm -hmm. retirement is okay. He told me, get it in writing, get it in writing. And I didn't. Mm -hmm. And then he said, uh, you know, uh, don't, don't, don't. It's not up to you to do that calculation. Mm -hmm. If their records don't have it, then mm -hmm. what the CFO already told you stands. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I, I acquiesced and came up with 18 years, which was not enough. So. I see. Anyway, I that's that was a bitter pill, but so yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I kind of have to stop. Yeah, no, so. yeah. Not, 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 that's uh, you're more than generous to your time so far. So thank you so much. Sure. Uh, and and as they say, the rest is history. And I've been yeah. here. Been I'm here. It'll be it be twenty years in September. So yeah. it's okay. like, how did that happen? Yeah. Anyway. Well, it thank did. you so much. Sure, you're welcome.
So is this this is a podcast? Is that what it's going to be? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll send I'll send I'll send you the link to. Okay. Okay. All right. Th thanks for your time too, Barry. Yeah. Thank okay. you. All right. Bye for now. Thank you.